Hello and welcome everybody. SF Live episode 145 this morning. I'm really excited to welcome back George Ogilvy in a couple seconds. He's the president and CEO of Battle North Gold. We've had uh, George actually on a while ago and it's been, it's been too long actually. We, we needed to catch up. The company's well on its way to production. They're planning to produce gold in Red Lake or in the Red Lake camp in 2021. So long overdue to catch up with him. But be reminded, this is an interactive format. Make sure to use hashtag ask bnau that's a uh, their ticker on the toronto stock exchange make sure to use the twitter function of course for that use the youtube chat as well make sure to get your questions in i think this is a really really interesting story lots happening also in red in the red lake camp they have lots of exploration upside we're going to get to all of that with george but make sure you use that function like we do all our interviews live so therefore i urge you to follow us on youtube follow us on twitter and uh, hit that little subscribe and like button as well. Leave uh, that little bell icon as well notifies you when we go live with another update. So make sure to use that opportunity to get ahead of the curve and ahead of the herd. Now, that being said, let me switch over to Mr. George Ogilvy. George. Hi, Kai. Hi, how are you? Are you? It's been too long. Uh, yeah. We've all been busy, but uh, you guys have been super busy. You're on the track to production. It's great to catch up with you this morning. So thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, we've added a lot of new subscribers and followers a, to, to our Twitter channel or YouTube channel. So I think it makes sense to catch everybody up, bring us a bit of on the same level. Um, give us a quick overview of Battle North, and then we'll dive into some more Q&A and questions and all that good stuff. Yep. So thanks for having us on, Kai. Our main assets located in uh, Red Lake, Northern Ontario. It's the Bateman Gold Mine Project. Uh, last year, we put out a new 43101 compliant resource. In total, we were looking in and around about 1.3 million ounces with a diluted uh, grade delivered to the mill of around five and a half grams. And uh, as a follow-up to that, uh, last year, we put out our maiden feasibility study, um, which shows an initial nine-year mine life. And uh, we're very happy with that because it also included maiden uh, reserves for this project. Um, late last year, we also conducted a bought deal as part of the project financing that brought in approximately 62 million Canadian dollars before fees. And then at the end of last calendar year, we announced a 40 million US dollar credit facility with Macquarie Bank at a very competitive cost of capital which is approximately 50 million Canadian. So now the project is fully funded and we just announced uh, about a month ago that the construction and development had started up and we're anticipating pouring our first uh, gold dory bar in December of this year. Fantastic. All right, timeline is tight, it's happening. To what is it now? Nine months to production. So that's great. Lots has happened. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of financing things. So I figured it makes sense to start off with a capital market side. Um, you mentioned the Macquarie debt facility. Uh, you've signed a letter of intent. You've gone through all the technical due diligence, in my understanding. But uh, where, do, where do we stand on the definitive agreement? I don't think it's been signed yet. That's correct. It hasn't been signed. I think we're on the third or fourth turn uh, with respect to Macquarie Bank. And we would anticipate we would uh, be signing that definitive document uh, very shortly and announcing that uh, to the market forthwith. Okay. What's what's the ca the, the working capital right now? You said you raised over $60 million late last year. Like how much has been spent on production already? And just quickly give us an overview of the cap structure. Yeah. So late last year, we did have another debt facility with Sprott Lending, which we paid off, uh, which was $15 million Canadian dollars. And when the board of directors had seen the uh, feasibility study high level results, uh, they gave me authorization to pre-spend last year in November and December, approximately 3 million Canadian dollars on the project. And then a further $5 million uh, in January and February of this year. So up until early March, uh, we had actually spent $8 million Canadian already on the project. As I'm talking to you here today on the phone, the company currently has 38 million Canadian dollars cash in the bank. And with access to another 50 on the signing of the definitive agreement with Macquarie Bank, obviously that's some 88 million Canadian dollars. We anticipate uh, this year there's about another 50 million to spend on capital and approximately another 15 million to spend on working capital to put the project into production in the fourth quarter of this year. Fantastic. What are you going to do with the remaining $23 million? What's the plan for that? Treasury well, we bonds? 
Well, we, we do have to obviously have a corporate overhead in GNA. So, uh, you know, people like myself and, uh, you know, do have to take a small salary. But um, we also have a regional exploration. That's, that's what I was hinting at. So. Exactly, which is, uh, which is underway. And uh, this year we're envisaging spending six million Canadian dollars on the regional exploration, plus an additional one million on the string of pearls, which are four assets that are within two kilometers of the mine and the mill infrastructure that we believe over time, we can grow the resources there and actually use them then as supplemental or incremental feed into that big hungry mill, which is not being fully utilized under the uh, the feasibility study, uh, Life of Mine Plan. Oh, you're, you're taking so much away from what I wanted to talk about, but we're going to get back to the exploration side because I think it's really interesting on what you can do there. And of course, we're going to talk about the feasibility study in a, in a bit more detail. I want to stay, just stay, stay on capital structure for for a brief moment. Um, you've got massive analyst coverage on the street. The street loves you. I've marketed with you before. It's easy why the street to see why the street loves you, of course, and Battle North Gold. But uh, do you think you've been too successful with the institutional investors? Meaning well, we have you've very, got eighty yeah, percent shareholdership yeah, right, we, by institutions. We, yeah, we have a very strong institutional shareholder registry, as you pointed out. You know, eighty percent, um, you know, is held by institutions. So, to me, that's uh, a massive, you know, check mark for the management of the company and also the the, the technical aspects of the company of how we've de-risked the project over the years. But at the same token, um, you know, we know that retail, you know, brings the liquidity. And if there's a downside right now to our share structure is that we don't really have the liquidity that I would have uh, hoped for. It has been improving, but obviously we have to do a little bit uh, more work there with uh, with retail. Interesting. Yeah, because because it's, it's a like a chicken and the egg thing, right? The funds say, well, we need liquidity, but then they want institutional shareholdership to increase and that takes away the liquidity. So it's always uh, like there are two sides of the coin, right? It's great yeah. to have those long-term shareholders. And uh, for one, I see Royal Gold, for example, on there. Like what's the, the royalty burden on the project, on Bateman? Uh, approximately right now, it's uh, just under th a 3% NSR exists on all our claims in, in Red Lake. So it's something that's very, very manageable. And of course, we were extremely pleased that we got the project financing and we didn't have to commit to any more, you know, uh, streams or, uh, you know, royalties, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, takes money right out of the shareholders hands, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's that's very, very true. Um, you, you mentioned you've de-risked the, the project over the last few years. I think that's a great segue to talk about now the feasibility study. And I remember us talking about it and I've known you for, for a good number of years now your level of confidence. When we first worked together, it's it's been, it's been a while now, four or five years, maybe four years, mm -hmm. I think your level of confidence in the whole project where they would go back into production was at 70%. You were early, it was early days, we're still doing a lot of drilling and a lot more technical work. But you had taken a look at the project and thought, okay, this is something I want to get behind on It's like I've done my technical due diligence. But of course, I got to go through the motions, right? Yeah. Obviously, you're going into production now. So I'm assuming your confidence level is back is, is, is at 100%. But uh, correct yes, me if I'm wrong. There. Yes, no, so, it's, it's definitely 100. percent Yeah, and now like let, let, let's run through that. Like, how did you get to that 100? percent What was the most important one for you to sort of de-risk? Yeah. Okay, this actually makes sense because the resource was a big problem. I remember. Well, it was, and you have to understand a little bit where the former company was. So they built the mine only on preliminary economic assessments, which can have a plus or minus 50 percent, you know, degree of accuracy. Uh, there was never any reserves so you know nothing that was economically viable it was all resources and mostly in third category and the drill density back then was 55 meters so today as i said earlier we now have a feasibility study that has a class two level engineering that gives us a degree of accuracy of plus or minus 15 percent we've built a 10 percent contingency into the feasibility study we have reserves in the proven category, the drill density is 80, uh, 8 meters. Oh, wow. And in the, in the probable category, it's 19 meters. So the weighted average drill density is 17 meters, which obviously is 300% lower than the 55 meters they were dealing with before. And then the ramp up of this mine from when we declare production at the end of this year to commercial production, it still takes another year and the reason for that is that we want to get the capital development 12 months ahead of the mining crews, have 40 to 50 stopes ahead of ourselves, all which are going to be drilled off on 10 meter centers, 
bringing all the reserves up into the proven category. And in these type of deposits, which are known as being high grade nuggety where the ore is non-homogeneous, i.e. it's non-contiguous, non doesn't have that continuity to it. When you do that infill drilling, we're gonna have some unplanned positive surprises, but we'll also have unplanned negative surprises. It's just the nature of the beast, the nature of the deposit of how the gold is sort of distributed within the, uh, the mineralized areas. So the way to mitigate that risk is to get 12 months ahead of your capital development, do all the infill drilling. And when you see these, uh, you know, sort of uh, ups and downs in the grade profile, you've got enough stops ahead of yourself to be able to alter your plan. You've got that optionality, you've got that flexibility, and you can then ensure that you have a consistent feed grade into the mill. So we've come a long way, but we've also got plans ahead of us to further mitigate the risk, as I said. And one of the other key things that I think gave us confidence on this project was in 2018, we put a 40,000 tonne bulk sample through the mill after we had come out with our new geological structural model and first 43101. And uh, from that um, bulk sample, we ended up getting 5,200 ounces of gold out the mill versus 4,500 ounces, which the model predicted. We were 7% higher on tons and 6% higher on grade. And at the end of the day, as I said, that was about 14% more gold out the mill than what the model predicted. So that gave us some confidence that the new geological structural model we had put together and the way in which we were doing the resource modeling was, uh, was prudent, conservative, and very much in line with what we were actually seeing from the real results coming out the back end of the mill. So the, the feasibility study was actually based on some of the information also you collected in that box sample. So the accuracy is actually very, and, and you mentioned stage two feasibility. I, I'm, I know I'm not familiar with all the stages. So maybe you could actually explain what that stage two feasibility means. And you've had well, that box sample, yeah, before, right? So, not, yeah, not not all feasibility studies are created equally. So they, have a, they can have a class four, class three, class two, class one. Class one is the highest, it's sort of your definitive, you know, bankable feasibility study that's five to 10% degree of accuracy. Class two is typically at 10 to sort of 20%. Class three would be 20 to maybe 25%. Once you get beyond plus or minus 30%, you're really then getting into what we would call a pre-feasibility study. And as I said, from there, 30 to 50% or 45%, once you go beyond that, you're into a preliminary economic assessment, which was what the mine was built on, you know, five years ago. And Kai, I've always said, you know, I use the analogy, and sorry for repeating myself here, but building a project and building a company is no different than building your house. At the end of the day, if you don't put the proper foundation blocks and foundation stones in on your house, and you don't build the house in the correct order and in the right manner, and you take shortcuts, Eventually, you'll have a storm which you cannot control, and the roof and the walls will come crashing in around your head. And it's the same for any project, mining project or mining company that any executive team tried to build. If you don't follow the basic principles, you're heading for a disaster somewhere down the line. Yeah, that's something the Big Bad Wolf and the Three Little Piglets taught us as well, right? Uh, quite visually. So <laughs> I huff and I exactly. puff, and that's the end of that story, right? So, and that's the same with an ore buddy. If it huffs and puffs and uh, it blows your house away, right? So you need a good foundation. Um, but let's talk about the feasibility study real quick. You said you'd put it out in August, I think. Um, what has changed since then, actually? Like, I know it's like, and it's going to be another few months until you go into production. What will be changing till then? Well, the ramp up period uh, for the mill, um, the mill has a current permitted capacity of 1,250 metric tons per day. But in the feasibility study, we only reach that level in year two of commercial production, which if you consider this year is minus two, that would take us to you know sometime in 2024. Uh, and that's just a function of the ounces of gold per vertical meter that's in the Bateman mine we just can't mine enough tons and get enough ounces to that mill, you know, quickly enough over this period of time while we're doing all that development. So there is an opportunity in the next couple of years that if we could find additional tonnage, additional ounces in very close proximity to the mill, we could get up to the 1,250 metric tons a day 
much sooner than 2024. And that's part of the strategy of why we put out a compliant resource uh, or late last year, early this year on the McFinley deposit. So it's uh, got 40,000 ounces only of measured and indicated, 71,000 ounces of inferred material at around eight and a half grams. The, 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 the m and is sitting around six and a half grams. But the good news is that that 111,000 ounces combined is only over the top 200 meters of the mine, so from surface down 200 meters. And we've found mineralization with the same lithology, the same structure, the same mineralogy as McFinley, another 500 meters down in the package around our 685 meter level. So the main decline, which is going into the mine right now as part of the capital development, is actually going to go through the 183 level at McFinley, giving us access to those stoping blocks. And that means that if we can turn those resource blocks into reserves in the next 12 or 18 months, there's a possibility that we could get additional tons and ounces to the mill within the next two years as part of the pre-commercial production uh, plan and the commercial plan, which isn't included in the feasibility study. And then the same is also true beyond that. Once we're in commercial production at Bateman, the total, uh, the daily throughput never goes above 1,500 metric tons per day. But the mill is actually built and designed today for 1,800 tons a day. So if you can do a permit change here in the next couple of years, which would be our plan, and get the permits amended up to 1,800 tons a day, there's another three or 400 tons of additional excess capacity from year 2024 out to 2029 that's not currently showing up in the feasibility study. And again, that's where McFinley could play a major role. And then we've got another uh, resource uh, numbers coming out shortly on the Penn Zone, which also sits within a kilometer of the Bateman uh, mine and mill infrastructure. And that is coming out, I think, uh, in Q1, actually. So in the next couple of weeks, I'm assuming, or within, let's say, the next month, you will be putting yeah. out a resource estimate. And what can we expect from that as well? Well, the, the numbers are going to be sub 100,000 ounces. Again, we're only talking a couple of hundred meters below surface. We're not going to file its own independent um, uh, 43-101 report. Given the numbers, we, we're assuming are relatively immaterial in the wider scheme of things. So we are going to file the, the numbers within our AIF, which will be going out shortly as part of our uh, 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 annual uh, results in our AGM, which is coming up in, in June of this year. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, you, you said June, so you have to invite, what is that, mid-April you have to invite, I think, for it. So it needs to go in there, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So. It'll be part of the AIF. Okay, uh, so we so we talked about some exploration upside, obviously. Let's and, and you hinted at it, and I had to stop you there because we drifted off topic. But let's talk regional exploration real quick. Uh, you said you're spending six million dollars on regional exploration, one million dollar on the string of pearls. Um, is that like how how is that distributed? Like the six million dollars, how do you plan to spend it? How much of that is drilling? Um, yeah. yeah, and how how will um, how will that add value to the company? Yeah, well, we've identified uh, initially four primary targets that we'd like to go after. The first of those is known as McQuaig DMC. And um, if you follow the main mine trend mineralization that goes through the Campbell, the Red Lake and the Koshna mine, which are owned and operated by Evolution Mining. And I'm sure everybody knows Campbell and the Red Lake mines, which are synonymous with Gold Corp and have been around for many, 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 many years. Um, if you follow that mineralization trend, it brings you on to um, McQuaid DMC. So about three weeks ago, we mobilized our first regional exploration drill. We're on the third hole now at McQuaid. The assay labs in uh, Northern Ontario are extremely busy. So we're waiting on assays coming back uh, from that drill. Uh, but that's the reason why that's a primary target. The second target for us is another deposit known as East Bay which is adjacent to the gas zone, which belongs to Evolution Mining. They have a compliant resource on the gas zone of 360,000 ounces at eight grams per tonne, very close to surface. And we believe based, based on the plunge and the azimuth and the depth of that deposit, it should come over the imaginary boundary 
onto Battle North's property at East Bay. And uh, about two weeks ago, uh, we actually mobilized our second drill to East Bay, and we're currently on the second hole there. Beyond that, there's also another property known as Advance, and then there's another one for later in the year known as Slate Bay that we'll probably be looking to begin work on in the third uh, third quarter of this year. You, you mentioned the laps are fairly slow. So like my question is now, uh, A, how material are those results to you? And, and B, how do you plan to release them, right? Because you will be going maybe do it through a bit of a slower news phase mm -hmm. while you're in construction. Will you yeah. be using that news flow sort of as a uh, to, to, to fill the news pipeline, I guess? Yeah, exactly, Kai. You hit the nail on the head. When, when companies go into the development and construction phase, usually the information which can come out can be fairly bland. So the, the plan of action is, is to update the market on the construction and development schedule that we execute on, but at the same time supplement that information with results that come out from the regional exploration. And of course, if you look within the camp the last couple of years, it's been a real hotbed of activity. Great Bay Resources has done a phenomenal job at the Dixie project and heading some wonderful high grade, you know, results over some significant widths. And they've seen their market cap climb from a few tens of millions of dollars up to, I think today, 800, 850 million Canadian dollars built purely off of the exploration success that they've had at the Dixie project. I would argue that if we could have you know, some intersections similar to what they're, they're seeing, given that we actually have a mine and a mill that's permitted is within nine, 10 months of first production, given we're only exploring on 10% of our entire regional land package of 28,000 hectares, given we're sitting with $700 million in tax loss pools within the company, never paying any income tax on the Bateman project over the next nine years, at least anyway, at today's spot prices, and given the quality of the management team that we have with the track record of turning around broken stories and difficult assets, i.e. Curtin Lake Gold as a prime example, I, I think that really could you know, light a fire uh, under our share price. We could see some fantastic returns for our shareholders over the next 12 months if we were to see a catalyst from a successful regional exploration program. Yeah, I don't think you just need their exploration program, but I think the re-rate is happening as you're going into production. There is that development to produce your re-rate, which is almost automatic, right? Which and, I and, think, yeah, and I'm yeah, not to like yeah. want to take things ahead, but I know the the average number is over 100 percent that the re-rate is, right? Yeah, so, we're currently trading right now around 0.4 times price to nav, and being a single asset producing company next year. You know, we're probably going to be valued in and around 0 0.7, 0 0.75, you know, P to NAV is, is normally where a single asset producing company would be. So with no further uh, share capital issuance, you, you could be looking at a 70 to 80 yeah. percent you know, increase in the share price from today. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you said single. So that's interesting because I, I meant to ask you about your Nevada projects. You said single asset. You do, of course, regional exploration in the Red Lake camp. But what's the opportunity in Nevada? What are we looking at as shareholders? Will we see a dividend? Is that a spin out opportunity? Or are you just going to keep those and figure it out at a later stage? Look, it would be fair to say over the last four and a half years since we restructured the company, Nevada hasn't been high on our agenda. It's been a non core asset. We really needed to put, you know, the horse in front of the cart. And now that we've got our core asset up and running and we're busy to, you know, expend resources on the string of pearls and the regional exploration program within Red Lake, I think over the next 12 to 18 months, we can start to turn our attention to Nevada and try and determine just exactly what we want to do with that asset. At the moment, we, we, we we're not quite too sure. And of course, the one thing that's happened in the last five months is in November of last year, we actually hired a new regional exploration manager, which was a position that we'd never filled within the company because our core asset was really all about engineering and, and doing you know, mine related things. So now that we're branching out, we brought in Maura Cobb. Maura is a professional geologist, just over 10 years of experience. She lives and resides in Red Lake. And for the last seven years, she was actually working for Goldcorp, Newmont Goldcorp, and Evolution Mining. 
And uh, in the last four of those years, she was the regional exploration manager for those companies. So we're extremely pleased that we hired Maura, obviously bringing in somebody with that talent and those qualifications, but the intellectual knowledge and property that she now holds within her, her head obviously could be quite strategic for us within the Red Lake camp. She's just getting her feet under the table, but I would think in another six to 12 months, once we've got our programs really established in Red Lake and hopefully successful, she will have turned her attention to the uh, assets in uh, Utah and Nevada, and we'll have a better game plan as to how we want to proceed with those. Great. Since, since we're coming to the end of our conversation, I have a, one more random question that I couldn't fit in before, and it's more about permitting going into production. And uh, there's still an impact benefits agreement outstanding with the local First Nations. Maybe you can give us a quick update on that as well, because that's material, like extremely yeah. important. Otherwise, you don't have anything. Yep. Yeah, so we have two uh, First Nation groups which have claims in Red Lake. There's the Wapaskang First Nations and the Lac Sioux. We have expiration agreements with those groups that, you know, uh, pays them out in cash or shares on an annual basis based on how much we expend on pure expiration. And we've had a very good relationship with them over the last four years. We're now into our almost third month of IBA discussions with them. Uh, we have terms of reference. We have a draft uh, proposal on the table. We're now trying to conclude the, uh, the financial section, which obviously is the most critical. And uh, we've already made some inroads into the business section, uh, where obviously they're looking for some business opportunities to be spun out, you know, from our from our activities in, in, in Red Lake. So negotiations are going well. We would envisage that probably sometime in the second quarter of uh, this year, we should have a signed IBA. And uh, that puts us in good stead for starting up the mill towards the end of the third quarter. Uh, typically, obviously, when we go to the provincial regulators and we make the application to start the mill up, they will ask us, have we consulted with the First Nation? And if we can show them that we've consulted and also we have a impact benefits agreements, then it's easier for them to give us our final permits to move into production. Fantastic. So you ran through, you ran us through the timeline, so I don't have any further questions, but it's extremely important. It doesn't work any other way. Uh, what One more question that just came to, came to mind as well. Of course, you're busy with your own projects in terms of regional exploration. Do you see any other opportunities around it in the Red Lake camp that would make sense to consolidate? And maybe you can also throw in some commentary on Red Lake in general. Like, what do you see happening overall? I know you, you constantly talk to bankers and brokers that are probably trying to hawk any project that's available yeah. uh, off to you. So I'm just curious to get a feel for the district itself? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, it's been a hotbed of activity. I mean, Pure Gold uh, poured the first gold bar last December and are now in production, barreling towards commercial production. So that's a critical milestone for them. Uh, Great Bay Resources has both been going gangbusters and you know, I would assume we'll see a, a 43-101 come out, coming out of there. Evolution's obviously the big player in the camp. I think they're uh, very much digesting their acquisition of the Newmont Gold Corp assets, which closed last year, April. So they're really just coming up on sort of uh, 11 months within the camp. And Jake Klein, the executive chairman, has openly spoken in two to three years' time about potentially being mill constrained within the camp. So that tells me he's confident that he can execute on his uh, plan of, which is more you know, sort of bulk, bulk mining, uh, you know, centric as opposed to, you know, uh, narrow vein selective mining. And they're, they're therefore going to be supplying additional tons to their existing mills. So, you know, Jake, I think, will be looking to either expand his existing mills or build a new mill or potentially looking to acquire, you know, mill capacity from within the camp, which obviously could be good news for both ourselves and or Pure Gold who have existing mills within the camp. So, I think it's a great time to be in Red Lake um, for those four companies. And of course, there's lots of other juniors up there who are uh, developing their uh, uh, land claims. And uh, it's been an exciting story. And I think it's only going to get more exciting as we as we go yeah. forward. But, but your pipeline is full right now. You're not looking. Our pipeline is full. What I would say, Kai, is that um, if we get to execute on the go it alone strategy, uh, probably at some juncture in the second half of next year, you know, we would be in production barreling towards commercial production. You know, being a single asset producing company with an underground gold mine, 
uh, always carries with it some degree of risk. Uh, so we would be actively looking ourselves at M&A. And of course, if we could acquire another gold producer or developer in Ontario, it could give us the uh, advantage of taking use of some of those tax pools that we have that could be deployed um, you know, away from Bateman to that other asset or entity. Fantastic. George, that was extremely insightful. Really appreciate the update. Thanks for running us through the, the updated Battle North Gold story. Uh, just, just put a bow around it real quick. Next Catalyst, next news releases, Macquarie debt facility, I'm assuming is one of the next ones. Hopefully some drill results. Anything else? I'm yeah, missing? yeah. Um, Macquarie, uh, the Penn Zone resource and the AIF and uh, some regional exploration drill results heading into the, the second quarter and then just regular updates on that and the construction and development schedule. And then, as I said, start up of the mill in the uh, early fourth quarter of this year and uh, first gold ore bar being poured in December. Phenomenal. That's a tight timeline, so I'm quite excited. Like We, we need to catch up then earliest in the fall to see how things are going, how, how what the production timeline still looks like at that time. George, it was great talking to you. Thanks so much for coming back on and uh, hope to see you again soon in person. Thank you, Kai. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, my pleasure. And everybody else, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. This was SF Live episode 145 with George Ogilvy. He's president and CEO of Battle North Gold. And uh, make sure to follow us and uh, hit, hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. Turn on that little bell notification as well. We do all our interviews live. So in case George or any of the other CEOs we interviewed drops a little nugget here and there, you do have the advantage. So make sure to use that. And uh, that's the best we can do for you while we're still not live and physical. So let's, let's, let's keep it that way and make sure to subscribe. Thanks so much.